So we've seen some responses to tragedy and memory, and I was thinking of, of Picasso's Guernica and how that is a well-known painting about memory, about memorializing the bombardment of a town in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. But it, you could look at it as a memorial piece, but you could also look at it as an activist piece because of its history. I remember when Colin Powell delivered his lies to the United Nations Security Council and they veiled the Guernica painting that was behind him so that the message of that painting couldn't be seen while he was making up his stories about weapons of mass destruction. So I wanted to ask, uh, I wanted to ask everybody when these attacks happen, these attacks being like the al Mutanabi attack, um, so many attacks since then, we often say never forget. Um, and all of this life is, this loss of life is worth memorializing, but um, it's interesting just to think about how this particular project has garnered a lot of support and a lot of people have responded to it. I wonder if anybody has anything to say about what it is about this particular attack that strikes them. Anybody? Well, I don't, I guess my initial in instinct is that it, when I was asked to be a part of it, but basically it was learning about what it was and then also um, just how, how much it was like an attack on, on all humanity when those kind of things happen, like it affects all of us on such a deep level. Uh, I know for myself I was thinking about, you know, reading and the access to books and all that. My parents, you know, both of my parents had no education, did not read or write. We didn't have books in our house when I, when I was growing up until we got into school. Then, I, you know, we got books and we read. But I think, you know, learning and has always been like a really uh, critical thing for me and for my life and for my family, for my whatever I do. It's always connected to that because uh, my parents couldn't do it because they were deprived of that, not because they didn't want to do it. So I think that that's the, the human part of it that's really, uh, for me, it's just like, you have to respond to those, to something like that. I mean, there's just no way you can't, as an artist, yeah, just as a human being. Yeah. Anybody else want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, continue what you were saying about this. Um, it, it seems a particularly heinous, somehow a heinous attack, this element with the Nabi attack, this bombing, because it goes beyond just the physical erasing of people, but it, it goes deeper, it tries to erase uh, a culture, a civilization. But I remember the words shock and awe, that started this whole thing. It meant to shock and awe and destroy in a way that was spectacular, not just the usual destruction. It was shock and awe. And we're still dealing with it. And many years, uh, what, for thir 13 years later, I was still shocked and awed by the ramification, the reverberations, all the consequences of that initial attack. And it's... Uh, it's, I think, very telling that this happens in the cradle of civilization, what we've always called the cradle of civilization. So it's a very pointed attack on civilization itself. Either of you want to say something, Olga? Yeah. Well, I, I was just thinking that, you know, like attacking a booksellers, uh, what, I mean, everybody, like, you know, like the, the spot that all the publishers were and the booksellers were, not that you're killing the people, but it seems like an attack on something that now we are lucky that we can reproduce things, but there are things that have completely been destroyed, like historical um, sites in Syria and in, in, in Iraq. And I think literature and art is is something that is very important to preserve. 
and if you if you take away even that, you know, how can people, you know, refer to history, to to what that had brought them to the, today, to who they are? That's why I thought it was very important to to do something about it, to um, this act of solidarity to to the people. Um, did you want to say anything, or shall I? Oh well, I I I think that we have uh, said what I I feel. Uh, just to add that um, you know, attacking books or art or monuments um, to me it, it's it's like attacking my humanity. You know, all that is rich about being a human being is under attack. And I think that's why we feel so viscerally about this particular uh, bombing, you know, because um, there are bombings all over the place. But this particular one, it, it, just, it just feels like it's attacking who you are as, as a higher human being. And that's why I, I felt really drawn to this project. Well, I'd, I'd like to pull that apart a little bit because there's this, uh, it's very common to say, you know, we are in a battle between culture and barbarian. Mm -hmm. uh, and I like to think that uh, that there is a culture, but, but is the culture the culture of, I don't know, Hollywood and McDonald's that we're defending? Uh, is the barbarian only the suicide bomber? There, there seems to be such an, uh, a possibility of a duality here between like, we're good, they're bad. Um, I just wonder if we could pull apart like, what is the culture that is worth defending or is defend, defensible? And what is, the, what is it that we perhaps are against? I, I think it's a, a great point. Just recently, a few days ago, I don't remember who the intellectual, French intellectual, who made this point, he said, talking about this, he said, you hear a lot about clash of civilizations. It's actually a clash of barbarities. Two barbarian impulses coming at each other. There is no culture versus bar 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 barbarity. It's barbarity against barbarity. Yes. And people, <laughs> and people get st stuck between the two. It's not as if the American people, for example, are the the barbarians are the civilized ones, and the opposite can be said about the Iraqis, let's say. It isn't the case. It's the peoples who are stuck between these barbarians from the West and these barbarians who are indigenous barbarians. So it's a very good question. You know, where is the barbarity? Where is the civilization? It's not what we think, what we're accustomed to, you know. This country versus that country, the good country against the bad country. You want to take that, Nancy? Well, well I, I don't see it, you know. I mean, I create mandalas where everything is included, so I don't see, like, oh, this was done to this. I mean, there were all kinds of books destroyed there, um, including probably some from Hollywood, <laughs> Walt Disney cartoons or whatever. It is the the destruction, I think, what I feel is the, is the destruction of freedom, the freedom of having a choice of books or having a choice of, of anything that, that, that something has been taken away from me because they said I can't have this street where I can peruse all kinds of books. It's dangerous. And so that is, you know, destroyed, uh, no matter who destroys it, I, I, I feel that uh, that's what I'm talking about, that, you know, that to, uh, we're so used to having choices in this country, although we really don't, you know, but we're so used to feeling like we can walk in anywhere and buy this and buy that, but to, uh, what I'm trying to say is, to, to have a, um, a place where it's so precious to uh, get, gain knowledge or, 
or to even look at a cartoon, to have that whole street destroyed is what uh, I was reacting to. Right. Or maybe more broadly um, than this specific incident, this mm -hmm. idea of culture versus barbarity, I think you're referring to a, a wider uh, idea of the clash of civilizations, not specifically the Amutanabe Street. But uh, Juan, you want to say something? Yeah, I was. I don't know when I when I thought about it uh, in terms of your question or your other questions as well. I was like, okay, uh, you know, we make art, but we're not necessarily. You know, I don't consider myself an intellectual in terms of the way I break stuff down, but. Um, but I was thinking about culture and American culture, and American culture is, I don't know, to me it's like this conglomerate of so many things um, that make it, have made it rich, but those are the very things that are being under attack, and I think that the culture that is repulsive to me now is the the idea of white supremacy and that white people uh, own everything and take everything and have a right to everything. That's what we are, you know, uh, experiencing now. You know, more so than ever, and it's just like. It's just like an insult as a person of color in this country to have to, like, you know, so you f I mean, feel it, you know, and go through it. It's just like, I mean, how, how do you define culture when it's constantly ripped from you, you know, and you see it ripped from you, from your family, from the way you live, and things you try to do, and, you know, it's just constant, it's been constant, you know, and you try to, you know, be part of this society, you try to, you know, grow and have your family grow and raise kids and do things that are part of what you should be doing to enjoy your life, but it's just constantly attacked, you know what I mean? So the cultural definition for me, it's like really complex because uh, do I have to, you know, pick sides and make choices and, I don't know, it's very complicated. Do <laughs> you want to jump in, Goldman? No. no. <laughs> maybe, maybe we can talk about uh, the idea of the use of memorial in, in the contemporary cultural world, like how, how you see memorials functioning. Um, a lot of art, like, uh, like activist art might be more uh, asking for something from the viewer, maybe a kind of solidarity or some kind of action. Uh, maybe memorial art is a, is a subset of activism, a, a, a kind of activist art. But maybe, uh, I mean, you touched Goldbenu a bit on, on the idea of memory as a personal thing and how art can carry that memory. Do you want to talk a little bit more about the art, art as memorial? I mean, most of my work has always been personal. I mean, there have been a few times that I have done things that are more outside of me, but I think I see it more in a way that, like, when whether me you know like well i for me it's hard to talk about it because i constantly thinking about the fact that i've been uprooted and i don't belong i constantly feel i don't belong or where where do i belong and it's nothing to do with america or any specific thing it's just not knowing what to refer to that's why i feel memories are very important, even if it's not a, a particular event. It's just something that you can tie to and you can, you can feel that you exist. 
and that's uh, how I see it. Or I don't know, like, or like an example I can say that is more outside of my thing was like, um, well, we had a great professor at San Francisco Art Institute, and um, when I started there, he, he, I couldn't like, you know, it was very hard to be in a new place. And this person's class was really amazing. It was philosophy. So it seemed like you just go to somebody's intimate class and you just listen to him. And uh, I, at the time, I felt like being at his class was the reason that I was there. And after a year, unfortunately, we heard that he passed away. And um, so the class I'd taken with him was canceled, and I had another class. And fortunately, it was a lithography class. Mm -hmm. And um, so every Thursday, I started, and it was my first time working on a stone. And I created this piece. Uh, it was called The Disappearance of the Master. So every Thursday, I would think of everything that he used to tell us and or what he would tell us on those days. And I just worked slowly on that stone. And the fact that that stone also was holding all this history of everybody else who worked on it, I feel like it just helped. It was a healing process. So I see like art as a memory and that memory can be healing. I don't know if that answers the question. That's beautiful, yes. <laughs> Nancy, I mean, the interaction between the personal and the, so the cultural, social, wider social seems to be part of your mandala. Uh, definitely, and um, to piggyback off of you, the, the healing part is, is a very deep part of, of the art uh, that I do. Um, it, it's, it's a matter of, um, I mean, every one of those mandalas that I've shown today uh, it, it starts with the personal. You know, Brenda Wang Aoki's grandfather started Japantown, and he's in the mandala. So uh, it, it starts with a personal experience of somebody who went through the camps, but then it grows larger than that, um, where we have hundreds of pictures of uh, the entire camp experience and, and how that affects uh, present day Japantown. So, it, it, you know, and, and of course, Day of the Dead, it has my own parents in there, as well as uh, famous figures and, you know, but seeing it all together, knowing that you are grounded in history and you are also in present day, is a very healing kind of experience, even when talking about a, um, kind of a devastating topic, the interments. So we had a lot of people who came who actually went through the camps, but seeing that and also seeing that the community is still there um, and seeing all the changes and then knowing that the young kids are taking on the, the, you know, the telling of the story. Because one of the fears is that um, what they went through will be forgotten or it may be repeated. And that's one of the ways that uh, these mandalas really um, ground everybody in history and also keep the story alive. You want to say something? Well, I, I was just thinking of memorials. There's, there's so many memorials in this country, and very few of them represent the people from this country. I a lot mean, of horses with generals on top. Yeah, there's a there's one right here in front of the library uh, that has the uh, early settlers, and it's a tribute to their to their settlement here. And, and there's an Indian man, kind of almost laying down, and the friar is like pointing to him and pointing to the the heavens. I mean, it's just an insult to even have it here, but it's here. On 280, there's a hideous looking sculpture that somebody did out of cement or something of, of Juniper O'Sara uh, that they're trying to canonize. I guess the Pope is. I think they but did it, yeah. They probably did, but it's just the atrocities that he's a part of here in the Americas. It's just, I don't know, it's like another a front to who we are in our existence. I mean, I, 
the memorial that they did for the in Washington D.C. I think I'm I'm not sure what the artist's name was. I think it's Maya Lin. Mm -hmm. Vietnam Wall. The Vietnam Wall was really impactful, and I mean it really resonate resonated for a lot of people and for myself in terms of the just the listing of so many victims that were killed there. Um, but um, I don't know. It's just. I mean, I I think they're 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 necessary and there there's a need for it, but very few of them reflect. You want to us. say something, Khalil, about you know? your yeah? I, mean, I think you're bringing up the question of memory versus power. Memory runs into power, so you get people who are representing power instead of the the actual victims of what happened, and and unfortunately, victims are the majority. So you have a few people. Um, you have a lot of monuments in this country and other countries that represent the minority that won, and hardly anything about the majority of people who were massacred. Um, Maya Lin actually did that, if I'm not mistaken, that memorial was for the, the soldiers, the U.S. soldiers, not the four million Vietnamese and Laotians and Cambodians who were killed, which is atrocious to me. I mean. I have nothing against the 50,000 people who died uh, fighting there because they're not the elites of this country. They're just there as tools of, of the elites here. But how about the four million people who died? So the, the victims are not represented. I was involved in a project of Cesar Chavez in LA. I was trying to do a sculpture uh, honoring him. And uh, I went to that Placita, the Olvera Street, to see what were the statues already there. And they're all about the conquerors, the king of Spain, and nobody from here. <laughs> uh, you know, we always hear about never again, but we don't hear about the Holocaust that, that happened here. We only hear about what happened in Europe, because we're not guilty of it. As a country, we did not kill six million Jews, so that's very interesting what happened in Europe. How about what happened here? Not a peep. So it's all about power, and memory has this challenge of butting up against power. Well, that's a good place to end this, uh, and maybe we'll throw it out for any questions. There's somebody right there. Okay, great.